Looks like you fellas are getting ready to put a TV show together. What kind of operation is coming off? <laughs> operation Torque Flight, Tech. I'm just about to show Mike some new service procedures I picked up at our latest transmission school. Good idea, Ward. With a transmission as popular as Torque Flight, you gotta keep up with all the changes. I feel the same as Tech, Ward. What you gonna cover first? Why, uh, first I'd like to talk about tracking down the cause of some unusual shifting behavior. Now, for instance, suppose an owner reports that he can't get the transmission into reverse. A, uh, no reverse condition, in other words. Or suppose he said the car was sluggish on acceleration, like starting off in direct drive instead of breakaway. In other words, there was no downshift from third to first. Also, there could be an erratic downshift. I get the picture. Now, what would I do in a case like that? Why, well, you'd check the governor pressure first. So get the car up on the hoist, Mike. Raise it so the wheels are free to turn. Well, that's number one, of course. And then, on the left side of the output shaft support, remove the tap plug from the governor pressure takeoff hole. Connect a 100-pound pressure gauge. Start the engine and push in the number one button next. Your gauge should read no more than two or three pounds pressure at eight to ten miles an hour. Suppose I get more than three pounds. More than three pounds pressure means that the governor valve is open, probably because the weight is stuck. Right, and almost everybody knows an open governor valve admits pressure to the reverse blocker valve, and that's what keeps the transmission from shifting into reverse. So you'll have to remove the governor for cleaning and inspection. This means disconnecting the prop shaft and removing the transmission extension, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Mike. Then you can remove and disassemble the governor. You know, dirt can cause that governor weight to stick. A warped governor body or loose body screws can also set up the same condition. So can a burr on the edge of the governor outer weight, Mike. Such a burr will develop if the weight hits the ramp on the output shaft. Well, this weight's got a burr, all right. Then that's our guilty party, Mike. A burr will limit movement of the weight, and the governor valve will stay open. See? The weight doesn't have free movement in the body. That burr's going to have to come off, and we've got to grind a chamfer on the weight to keep the burr from forming again. Uh, for instance, put a two-inch number eight screw through the weight so you can hold the edge of the weight at a 45-degree angle against a grinding wheel. Apply light thumb pressure, but let the weight assembly turn by itself as you grind it. How deep should I go? Hold it to a three-quarter inch diameter on the face, Mike. A plus or minus a sixty-fourth. Then you'll get a chamfer that will clear the chamfer on the output shaft ramp. Now be sure to get a smooth finish. Hand file and polish off any grinding burrs. Then take the weight assembly apart and clean it. Inspect the governor body bore for nicks or burrs. Use crocus cloth to remove any roughness you find. Finally, clean and assemble the unit. Okay, Ward. I think I can handle that burr problem now. That's fine. Now, we've spoken many times about how important throttle linkage adjustment is to proper transmission performance. Now, for the sake of review, Mike, suppose you tell us how you go about making the throttle linkage adjustment. All right. First of all, there are two types of linkage arrangements. One uses a two-piece slip joint rod between the carburetor and the accelerator shaft lever on the dash panel. The other uses a belt crank mounted on the intake manifold and two rods, one from the carburetor to the belt crank and one from the belt crank to the accelerator shaft lever on the dash panel. On all models, I first check the linkage for binding and make any correction needed to remove interference or sticking. I start the engine let it run until it reaches normal operating temperature and shut it off. I remove the air cleaner and check to see that the choke is open and that the carburetor is off the fast idle cam. Then I hook up a tachometer, start the engine, and let it idle. Now we're ready to start adjusting. Let's take the slip joint rod type first. I loosen the nut on the clamp stud that holds the two rods together. Then. Down along the side of the transmission, I loosen the clamp stud nut that holds the two-piece rod which connects to the transmission throttle valve lever. The next step is to adjust engine idle at 475 to 500 RPM with the linkage loose 
and the transmission in neutral. Still with me? <laughs> Keep on going, Mike. You're doing swell. Then I pushed the rear rod back to get about one half inch clearance between the dash panel and the accelerator shaft lever. Hold the rods in that position and tighten the clamp stud nut. Next, I pushed the throttle valve lever in the transmission forward to the closed position, pull the forward half of the rod back to take out the slack and tighten the clamp stud nut. Then I go back to the upper linkage and loosen the clamp stud nut again. I push the rear rod back lightly to take up any slack and tighten the clamp nut. Hey, that's nice going, Mike. Now, what about the type which uses the two rods and the intermediate bell crank? Well, the procedure is the same, except that the upper adjustment is made at the rod from the bell crank to the accelerator shaft lever instead of at the slip joint of the two-piece rod. Good boy, Mike. That covers it right up to the adjustment of the accelerator pedal. Uh, what's the story on that? Oh, that's very simple. I use this template to set the accelerator pedal angle at 115 degrees. That's the most comfortable angle and gives the proper kickdown action. If I have to change the angle, I remove the accelerator pedal end of the accelerator shaft to pedal rod at the pedal lever. Then I turn the ball joint to lengthen or shorten the rod as needed. I then install the rod and tighten the lock nut. In addition, I check the rod to see that it's properly lined up so it won't bind. Then I recheck engine idle speed. That's the way I go about making the throttle linkage adjustment. Nice going, Mike. You really know your onions. Yeah, Mike. Good job. Now, you also know the wrong gear shift control cable adjustment can keep the engine from starting, can cause a drive in neutral, no kick down or normal downshift, and erratic shifting. Now, here's how you make the cable adjustment. Have someone hold the R button all the way in. That removes the slack from the linkage. Loosen the screw that holds the control cable adjustable bracket to the adapter housing. Next, determine the total free play of the cable. Push the cable into the adapter housing, mark it, and then gently pull it out. Measure the total amount of cable travel. Slowly push the cable into the housing one half of the total travel. Hold the cable at that point and tighten the bracket screw. Remember, Mike, always recheck the cable adjustment right after you make it. Push in the number one button, then the R button, noting the amount of over-travel in each case. Hey, Tech's got a dandy suggestion there, Mike. The amount of over-travel will be about the same at each button when the cable is properly adjusted. If either button has no over-travel, you'll have to repeat your cable adjustment. Okay, I've got the idea. I'll keep that tip in mind. Do that, Mike. Uh, right now... Somebody please turn the record so we can go on with more service tips on torque flight. Now, suppose you get a report of erratic starting, or one that says the engine won't start when the end button is pushed in. And we know our cable adjustment is okay? Yeah, Mike. So the thing to do is check the neutral starter switch. Remove the switch and see that the lever is located in the center of the hole so it makes contact with the switch. Then be sure the switch washer makes a good ground on the case. If these points are okay, but the engine still won't start, replace the switch. Okay, I'll remember that. So what else is new? <laughs> well, remember we sometimes get a report of a rough, erratic upshift? Throttle linkage and governor pressure are okay, and nothing you do seems to help smooth out the shift? Yeah. As a last resort, we've had to replace the whole front valve body assembly. Well, you don't have to replace that valve body anymore, Mike. With this new pin gauge, you can set throttle pressure by adjusting the throttle valve stop screw. Ward can give you that story. Well, to reset throttle pressure, Mike, the first step is to hook up a tachometer to the engine. Then, install a 100-pound gauge in the kick-down servo housing upper tap. Next, disconnect the accelerator shaft-to-transmission throttle lever rod. Start the engine... Push in the D button. Hold the transmission throttle lever towards closed throttle position against its stop in the transmission. And then slowly pull down on the accelerator pedal lever to increase engine speed to about 1,500 RPM so the transmission will upshift into direct. 
Now, when this upshift takes place, there should be a 26 to 32 pound compensated throttle pressure reading on the gauge. Now, what if I don't get that? Wait a second, Mike. There's more. You keep advancing the lever towards full throttle. Compensated throttle pressure should start rising when there's zero to seven thirty seconds inch travel at the outer end of the lever. Tex right. So, if pressure was above 32 pounds with the lever against the stop, and if pressure increased immediately when the lever was moved, you'll have to adjust throttle pressure. Or, suppose you read the 26 to 32 pounds, all right, but pressure failed to rise after moving the lever seven thirty seconds of an inch. In this case, you still should make another check while the engine's running at 1,500 RPM. Advance the lever slowly to about three-quarter throttle position and return it to closed position. Compensated throttle pressure, in this case, should rise to about 80 to 90 pounds and then always fall smoothly without hesitation to the specified 26 to 32 pounds at closed throttle. Okay. Let's say I don't get that 80 to 90 pounds compensated throttle pressure. What's it mean? Well, it points to faulty throttle compensator valve or throttle valve operation. Now, that, of course, means draining the transmission, dropping the oil pan, and removing the valve body for thorough cleaning. After cleaning and inspecting the valves, reassemble the body and install it in the transmission. Reinstall the oil pan and refill the transmission to its proper level so you can check operation. Yeah, that's right. You would recheck compensated throttle pressure. If you read 26 to 32 pounds, nothing more has to be done. The trouble was corrected. But if you don't get the correct readings, the only thing left to do is reset throttle pressure. That's where this new gauge comes in. Yeah, Mike. And here's how you do that. First, of course, you have to remove the valve body from the transmission. Loosen the throttle valve stop screw nut and back off the screw about five turns. Insert the gauge pin between the valve lever tang and the end of the kickdown valve. Keep the pin in line with the valve. Push in the kickdown valve to compress it against its spring, bottoming the valve completely inside the body. Now, as you do that, tighten the throttle valve stop screw finger tight so all free play of the lever is removed. Then, with a wrench, Tighten the stop screw nut securely and remove the gauge. Reinstall the valve body, the pan, and the throttle linkage. Then fill the unit to the proper level with automatic transmission fluid type A and adjust the linkage. Recheck compensated throttle pressure to be sure your work has been done correctly. Pretty neat. That gauge will come in handy as a last resort to bring the transmission back to normal. Mm, that's right. Now, let's look at another condition. Suppose an owner reports that the transmission seems to drag in reverse. as a very sluggish reverse operation, as though the brakes were on. Now, in a case like that, the chances are that the front clutch pack has the wrong buildup of discs and plates. This wouldn't let the clutch release properly when the transmission is in neutral or when shifted to reverse. Sounds like a disassembly job to me. Right. So you remove the transmission and disassemble the clutch. Uh, then Ward can tell you how to build it up properly. Sure, Tech. But any time we have the unit all apart, let's inspect those seals. Now, for instance, it pays to carefully check the interlocking seal rings on the intermediate and output shafts without removing them. There should be no worn or broken interlocks, and they should turn freely in their grooves. Also, Check the input shaft seal rings, the front pump drive sleeve seal ring, and the front pump housing seal. All of these seals look okay to me, Ward. Yeah, that's fine. Now, getting back to building up the clutch. You first install the front clutch piston, levers, return spring, and spring retainer in the front clutch piston retainer. Then, install the front pressure plate. Following that, you install a driving disc then a plate. Keep this up until four discs and three plates are installed. Now, don't install the cushion spring or retaining plate at this time. Okay, so far. Now what? Remember that the front clutch pressure plate needs the right amount of travel when pressure is applied. 
This means you've got to maintain the right amount of disc clearance. Good point, Ward. In fact, that's the key to the whole business. Not enough disc clearance will cause the clutch to drag. Too much clearance will cause delayed clutch engagement. All right, but how do you check that clearance? Well, you temporarily install a rear clutch pressure plate on top of the clutch pack. Hold it firmly in place by hand and insert a feeler gauge between the pressure plate and the top disc in the assembly. Total clearance should be 20 to 40 thousandths. Now, if you don't have that, you'll have to replace the discs with any combination of new discs that will give you the 20 to 40 thousandths clearance. Those discs come in three different thicknesses, Mike. You won't have any trouble putting the right combination together. Yeah, tech's right. And when you get the proper clearance, remove the rear clutch pressure plate, install the front clutch hub, then install the cushion spring retaining plate and the cushion spring with the concave side facing the spring retaining plate. Concave side down, huh? Yep. Then complete assembly of the input shaft and snap ring by using two large C-clamps or an arbor press. Okay, Ward, I got you. You made that clutch pack build up very clear. Yeah, Ward, a mighty fine instruction job. Mike will also find this reference book helpful. It's got the complete story on what we talked about, plus some extra torque flight corrections. Good news, Tech. I sure can use that reference book. Fine, Mike. I know now that you and all of our master technicians are better able to do your part in keeping our torque flight owners satisfied. Better service, remember, means smoother sailing for all of us. Mm -hmm.